Speaking of comics, reminds me of one of my favorite comic comments that Glenn ever met, that I ever heard Glenn make, and it was at the 2006 Robert E. Howard days, and when I was inter moderating, interviewing him and Roy Thomas together up here at the at the school, and uh, <coughs> somebody said, "Well, when the Conan comic came out, what did you think of it?" He said, "Well, it didn't make me throw up." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that covered it, yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen to all the Howard papers and material that Glenn had? There's, um, there'll be a big delivery to the, because uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, a long time ago, uh, I was chatting with Glenn one day and he was talking about how, well, you know, when I die, I don't want all these things to be lost. So. We ought to, you know, I wonder if, I wonder what we should do about it. And I said, well, you know, you can always donate them to, you know, a rare book library, and they'd love this stuff. He said, he said, you really think so? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, the typescripts, you know, he only owns 98% of all the extant typescripts, you know, 15,000 plus pages, you know. I'm like, yeah, yeah, they, they'd love this. And he said, well, where do you think? Well, at the time I was attending law school at the University of Texas, so I said, um, and so I would, that would have been 18, 19 years ago. And so I said, well, let's go visit, so let's go see if UT, and you, the, the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas, Austin, is a rare book library. It's a five, six, seven story building, has one floor open to the public, um, three paper labs, about 20 chemists, um, an amazing amount of money flows through. They have an original Shakespeare folio. They have... They have the original draft of Ulysses, James, uh, Ulysses by James Joyce. They have one of they have a Gutenberg Bible, one of three in the United States. They have an amazing collection with big money funding it. And I called them up, and I, I remember doing this. It was so much fun. I call them up and I say hi. I'm a law student over here, and they go yeah. And I said, you ever you, you ever heard of Robert E. Howard? And they go of course. And I said you ever heard of Glenn Lord? And they go of course. And I said. He's looking for some place to donate the original typescripts. And the guy just goes to pieces right there. And he's just like, well, why don't you bring him by? We'd be glad to see him. We'll buy him lunch. We'll have a great time. We'll show him this. It'll be a wrong time. Come on, come on. What do you want to do? Now, tomorrow, next day, next day, next day. I'm like, easy, easy. Okay. I said, well, we'll get there. And we, we picked a day, and Glenn came up, and we went in. And, and they gave us the, the $5, not the nickel tour, the $5 tour. They took us through every floor of the building. They would just stop somewhere and randomly pull something off the shelf and it would just make you go because oh, it was so cool you know and and they'd stop in the we stopped in a paper lab and there's a lady in there and the big lit up glass table and she's got a, a what appears to be an old ledger book and she's doing some stuff with it and there's solutions and bottles and i'm an old chemist so i'm kind of watching this with interest and i said what do you got there she says this is a ledger book from a plantation in the civil war i said what are you doing she said well, when the, the, the Confederates needed the, needed, they, they took over the plantation to turn it into a munitions dump, they needed a way to keep track of what was going in and out, so they took the ledger book, the, 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 the ledger book that belonged to the plantation, and pasted down pages over the top of it, over each of the pages, so they'd have a new place to write new stuff in. I said, ah, so what are you doing? She goes, I, you know, and this was done in 1840, you know, 1862, and I said, what are you doing? She goes, I'm taking them back apart without destroying what's underneath. I was just like, oh. Yeah. And it was, you know, they were reskinning a book of the world from, from, you know, 1520. And it was just amazing. And we go through the entire thing. I mean, and they're just, I mean, they're bringing, all the executives are coming out to meet him and shake his hand and have, you know, very nice suits. Trying, and then we all go into this big, beautiful room to have lunch together. And, you know, big drapes and big portraits and a big, massive oak table. And he bring out these cheap little box lunches. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at Glenn, and Glenn looks at me, and we both just grin, because we, we both immediately know what this means, is that they're going, now, it'd be great if you just donated them and we didn't have to pay for them, you know, because we have no money at all. Oh, no, we're poor, we're broke, you know. And, and Glenn and I were both just breaking up about it. But he said, yeah, that, that's where all my stuff, They'll, I mean, they had things for preservation I didn't even know existed. You know, they, they had, they had, they would order these custom foldable box things that were acid free just to hold a chapbook that would be custom molded to and they they had them for everything and, and of course they already had a they had a, a pretty massive um sci-fi fantasy collection they'd acquired from lloyd curry over the course of 20 years or whatever
Um, I talked to them again a couple months ago, and they were very clear that they, they really want those. They, you know, they'd be more than happy to take those those type scripts. Let me know when. We'll do a press release. We'll do a big we'll do a big dog and pony. Bring the bring the family. Whatever you want to do, we'll get some photos. It'll be big. And I'm like, okay. They weren't interested in the books. They're like, we got books. We don't need books. We're not we're not a we don't want everything in the world. We're a rare book thing. We spend our money on the extremely unusual and rare and expensive. We want the type scripts and Glenn's correspondence. But we don't want we don't want the books. We got we got books. We don't need books. So uh, the books will go elsewhere somewhere somehow but the um, eBay, eBay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have a question um, are the uh, is that collection going to be open to uh, Howard fans to review you have obviously never been to the Harry Ransom Center it's um, indeed we had a we had a talk about do we want to go to A&M instead just because but uh, Harry Ransom is a real good job taking care of stuff they got sued about 20 years ago by some big author because they let somebody come in and look through the guy's papers that he had donated while he was still alive. And then whoever it was wrote a biography. Selinger. Who was it? Selinger. Selinger. And they wrote, a, they wrote a, a biography based on that, and he sued the university over it because he was really hacked. And so they have very – it's easy to get access to go look at stuff. I mean, literally, you go in a room, they make you empty your pockets, get rid of everything. I think they let you bring in a, a, you know, an iPad or a computer now. No writing instruments of any kind. Um, and then you go, you know, once they run you through the metal scanner and the, the full mod, body scan or whatever, they have a little room you can go into and, and that's as far as you get. And then you go tell the person at the desk what you want and then they will send a runner to go get it. And, uh, so like I've reviewed the L Sprague to camp papers there and they're, they're adequate. You know, I call them a day ahead so they have time to make sure they know where it's at and have it sitting on a rack waiting for me. Yeah. Um, but they'll, they'll bring it out and set it out there and let you look at it. The uh, the foundation you can take pencil notes. and you, and they'll give you a pad and pencil. But they'll they watch they you, provide. but they'll give you, you know you aren't gonna they're gonna be watching you while you do it, but they'll give you a pad and pencil. Um, uh, the foundation has been working on uh, scanning and indexing the entire collection first of all the TypeScript, so we can actually find everything, see everything, and not have to go through a lot of hassle to see what we need to see when we need to see it doing a book or whatever. So. So they'll be uh, the originals will all be safely stored, but we'll have uh, readily available, and we'll have a big index to go with it when we get around to it. And it's a it's a lot. It's you know, when I say fifteen thousand pages, I mean some things are neatly organized in bundles of you know here's a, here's a story, here's a story, here's a story, here's a story. Well, well, Bob didn't work that way. You know, Bob was he would he would write a draft. He would type up a draft, no title. You know, all the text was out to the very edge. Fill the thing up. He'd he'd miss the miss start a page. Throw away that. You know he'd set that page back. Slide another one in between and just retype the page. And then when he got done with it, he'd type a new version to clean it up. Well, then he'd take that draft, turn it over, and use the backside for something else. Well, the one he started with was 37 pages. The story he wrote was 22 pages. So he's got 15 pages left over. It goes with this and this to do the 60th page thing he's going to do. That's all on the back, or it's a carbon. You know, and all he got left is a carbon because he sent the original to Weird Tales. And and he would use a carbon until it was illegible, so it's just and 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 again it'd be on the back of this, on the back of that, and and Glenn spent years sorting that stuff out, and he even he didn't get it all completely done not, with computers. Not frequently, Paul will send us something and say, "Okay, anybody recognize what story this might be from?" Anyone can can anyone name the western that has you know this person, this person, this person, and thank God we have Patrice, you know. Cause, yeah. Because I mean, I know I know a chunk, but oh my God, it's it's just amazing how many stray pages you'll pull up, and and and, it, and then it drives you. What gets you is then when you pull up one, and it's two pages out of the middle of a Breck story, and I'm going, I edited the Breck stories. I'm going, I don't know this story. You know, this is not a story I know. And we run it by everybody else, and we're all going, nope, it's a story we never saw before, and it's just two pages out of the middle of a whole story, and you're just like, wow, you know, what if the rest of it's in here, you know? And uh, you just keep digging. It's just, it's there's so much stuff to see, so much stuff to see. It just goes on and on and on and on. Um, so yeah, that that's the it, it'll. I think we're going to do the delivery in early July. Um, is a, sort of the tentative date. We we've got virtually all of it scanned. There's still a few more boxes to go through. There were there was a. As we said, Glenn had a lot of stuff and a lot of papers, and he saved everything. He had all this correspondence he'd ever seen. He had the, you know, people. Anybody ever heard of Locus, the magazine? Or the, stop saying. He had Locus number one. It's a mimeograph page. Number two is a single page. Gift number six. Ah, it's now two pages. It's growing in leaps and bounds. 
Okay? I mean, it's just amazing the stuff that you go you find it's just right just amazing. So the, it's a lot of stuff to look through and get sorted out and we, we want to get it to UT because that's where it needs to go and we want it all there, but uh, we want to we want to be able to kind of get our get our copy of the first four cents. Just make sure we have a copy. So. A, a suggestion: mm -hmm. if um, if if indeed you don't want to send the books to eBay, uh, you might want to consider sending the books to uh, Cushing at A and M. Oh yeah, and and, and and you know that that's that's actively, always the place. Yeah, they are actively doing that. I know they. You know, if anybody doesn't know it, Texas A and M has the Tevis Clyde Smith papers, mm -hmm. which includes about three hundred pages of letters from Bob Howard uh, in the original. Plus, they had, um, you know, they had, uh, they have the a lot of the old newspapers from school, the Tattlers. They have those kind of things. They have all sorts of, you know, kind of stuff of the time. Some photos, um, and they're and they're they're much more laid back about that. They don't. I mean, they have their their rare book thing is a room about the size of this, um, with a little storage area on the side, um, and you know, I brought out, I pulled out a Bob letter where it was the famous one where he wrote. He had just started working for the lawyer, so he took, uh, he had a, a you know a blank page that was you know of, of what's supposed to be done up for a, a summons or something, and he fills it in to basically accuse Tevis of rape, <laughs> and then and then he state and then you know and everybody and he, and he sent it to Tevis as a joke, right? That Tevis apparently didn't see the humor in, um, <laughs> and so they, but 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 Bob nobody had ever seen the second page. Because the second page, he stapled it all the way around. No. So to see the second page, you had to kind of pry it up and look in there or tear the staples off. And Tevis had never torn the staples off. He, you could pry it up and look in there and see that second page where it says, ha, 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 boy, ain't I funny. Yeah, you're right, I just got a job working for the lawyer. And that's all it says. You know? <laughs> and so I saw that and I said, man, I'm, I'm sitting here scanning all this, spending days scanning all this stuff. And I said, you know, I sure like a scan of that, but what? And it's real old staples, you know, and the paper's gotten a little rust to them. I'm going, how do you, you know, how do we handle that? Because it's old paper, you don't want to damage it, you know. And I, I walk up to the lady at the the desk, kind of guarding the desk, and I said, see this? And then she goes, yeah. I go, I really like to get a scan of that back page, but with the staples there, you know, I don't know what you guys want to do. And she goes, hmm. And I snap them out, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, ah, you know. <laughs> And, and of course, you know, perfect holes where she snatched them because the paper wouldn't wouldn't near wouldn't wouldn't yeah. take the abuse at all. Just pops them right out. And there's there you go. I'm like okay, thank you. Good thing you did. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it's a it's a different kind of <coughs> tood at at A and M. So I mean, it's it's very different from going into UT where they just lock you down and they're so protective of everything. It, so. is, it is kind of ironic that uh, uh, both the the camp papers. And the Glenn Lord papers are going to be in the same uh -huh. archive. Different they, floors. The <laughs> so there's no, you know, self, the self, self immolation when they all explode in flames. But <laughs> the, uh, yeah, and, and they made a, they made mention. Do what? That's right. Oh, yeah. Then, then they go Matter boom. They uh, they brought that up there when I called them. They said, "Oh, it'd be great. We got the decamp papers. We'd love to see Glenn's correspondence to go on the other side of this." You know, da 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 da. -da, -da. Now it's like going. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I have a question on here. Yeah, so I'm a, a newbie to Robert E. Howard, so mm -hmm. this is actually my second time up here. First time for half. Well, then you're not a newbie anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still um, learning a lot. Yeah. So um, I was just curious um, about uh, Glenn. What did you do for a living? Glenn worked in a paper paper mill in Pasadena, Texas. Pasadena, get down to Dena, Texas, just east of uh, Houston. And he did various jobs there and held various titles. I got to meet, uh, at his funeral, we got to meet some of his old co-workers who all remembered him fondly and, and uh, came to say their, give their last respects. And he held, I guess he held various jobs there. He was, he was boss for a while, and I think he turned down no, a couple he of... he wasn't. Well, we're going to say he was, okay. No, he was never a boss. He, he was not accepted. Yeah, that's right. He wouldn't accept it. That's what I was going to say is that he didn't want it. He didn't want to be boss. So he didn't, he didn't want the hassle. I think he had other things to do with his spare time. That's kind of a, um, a dirty business. I mm -hmm. mean, a lot of labor. A lot of labor. Mm -hmm. those who, right? That was part of the fun was that, you know, I mean, uh, there's a famous DeCamp letter where the, be, the DeCamps are being interviewed by somebody, and someone mentioned, you sure seem to be having a lot of trouble with, with that Glenn Lord fellow. And they, and, 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 the, and Catherine laughs and goes, you know, and he's just a truck driver. And a, he's just a truck driver in a chemical plant. How dare, you know, I can't believe he would dare to even, you know, converse with us. Because, you know, she just looked down her nose at him so bad. 
And it just, it, you know, that, it, that's always that problem of you don't have to go to college. Being smart doesn't mean you necessarily went to college or that you even cared to go to college to do what you wanted to do. He got to do what he wanted to do. He lived the life he wanted to live. He got married. He got a house. He got to chase his hobby and have a good time. He had a job that paid the bills. He was happy. I was talking yesterday with somebody. We were talking about, uh, he kept using the word educated. I said there's a difference between schooling and education. Mm -hmm. Glenn was a very educated man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of very Howard-esque yeah, kind of quality, too. And right? also he found that. not the only place where you can get education. That's yeah. right, you know. He found that you go there, doesn't mean you story very either. funny, too. Yeah. Yeah, Glenn got a kick out of it when he, Patrice, I think, sent him the, the quotation about the yeah. little more than a truck driver or something. Yeah, yeah. You're not, he said, who's he to cross literary swords with a great science fiction writer like El Sprague de Camp? <laughs> <laughs> Who shows up at conventions wearing the horn helmet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sad. At least he was wearing the furry diaper. Oh. I'm, glad I'm glad I didn't wear my horn helmet today. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of, you know, the cowboy hat, the helmet, I, I was really torn there. But I, <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, just just a comment real quick. Um, I, and you kind of touched on it before, but uh, I, think, I think the thing that I uh, that was always struck by was his generosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and, of course, you know, it, not just with time, but with materials and, and uh, and and the time that it took to answer fan letters mm -hmm. and maintain a correspondence on top of everything else, uh, I I, um, I was always struck by his exceeding generosity, mm -hmm. and I feel like that I feel like in a lot of ways Glenn's actions uh, in amongst uh, us have informed the way we ourselves mm -hmm. conduct ourselves. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm Glenn was faster than Rusty. <laughs> well, that, yes. <laughs> there are not too many people who aren't. <laughs> there. I, I, th I think I think uh, I, I think Glenn's Glenn led by example in that, in that respect, mm -hmm. and that was something that I was always um, amazed at. Yeah, you can still be a gentleman. You can still be gracious to people. You can still treat people the way they deserve to be treated. Yeah. And that's something I always enjoyed about Glenn. You know, when I first met him, I was nobody. You know, and I'm still not much, but I was nobody. And he didn't, you know, he, he treated me exactly the same then, then as, he did, as he did up until the time he died. We were always just a couple of fans hanging out, you know, having a good time. So I remember when you came to the Ransom Center because you stopped by at Austin Books. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that was the first time I got to see something out of Glenn's collection. Uh, he brought uh, some of Howard's homework. With yeah. he, brought, he brought a boy, a beehive, and a Chinaman. Yeah. And, I, and, and handed it to me very casually. Here you go. And I just, I, I didn't want to touch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here, take it back, take it back. Yeah. Neat stuff. Yeah. yeah I think one of, one of Glenn's uh, endearing qualities to us all was if you introduced yourself as a Robert E. Howard fan, you, you were, were his friend. Yep, mm -hmm. you were him. Glenn was a super geek, just like the, just like some of, us, some of us try to be. He was. He, he really was one of the greats at it. So he, and he had no... Had no shame about it. He knew who he was. He liked who he was, and and he was a very cool person. So I loved it. So. He was awesome. 